Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We're gonna wait about one more minute to let more people join in before we begin. Okay, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Ultimate Egypt webinar. My name is Julia Wong. I am the Marketing Director for Wild Women Expeditions. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that as a Canadian company, we are thankful for the opportunity to create, collaborate, play, and work on these lands, which are known today as Canada. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, and Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. So a little bit of the housekeeping tonight. We have our adventure experts with us, um, and they will be running through what you can expect when you travel with us on our Ultimate Egypt trip. At the end of the webinar, um, please feel free to start putting in your little, any questions that you may have into the Q&A box. They will be answered either during the presentation or at the very end. This webinar is being recorded, so it will go live. Um, we'll put it up onto the our YouTube page um, when it is ready tomorrow. So if you do have to hop off, please feel free to do so, and we will send you the recording. All right. And so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our adventure experts. Today, we have Franny Berg Schneider, who is our program and operations manager. And we have Caroline Owen, our community engagement manager. So I will let the both of them introduce themselves. Hello, everybody. I'm Franny Berg Schneider. Um, I work um, for Wild Women as the global program and operations manager. I work behind the scenes um, on the program. And I was lucky enough to be in Egypt in the fall of 2021, um, which was amazing. I'm so excited that I get to talk to you about it tonight because it was truly a life-shaping journey. And here's Klein. Thanks, Franny. Hello. So Many of you will know me as Klein, which is what my friends call me. So please call me Klein. I am the community engagement manager with Wild Women Expeditions. And that means I get to spend a lot of my time behind the scenes chatting with you and learning more about our community and what it is that you're um, most interested in. So I'm, and I also just returned from Egypt a couple of weeks ago, I guess a month ago now. And, um, super excited to share with you all about the trip while it's fresh in my mind and uh, uh, the sand is still between my toes. <laughs> <laughs> so who we are, we are Wild Women Expeditions and we have been offering trips for women by women for over 30 years now. <clears throat> and uh, I've been working with Wild Women for um, the last over 20 years, started as a guide and have played a lot of different roles in the company. And one thing that hasn't changed over the years is that we always strive to create a safe space for women in our in our trips, um, where the group dynamic allows women to thrive and to shine and to really be themselves, um, sometimes in a way that we're not able to in our own lives. So we we have this space where we get to really be ourselves and make connections with one another and uh, of course with nature, that's the, the wild part. <clears throat> and um, with local culture, so getting to know the places that we immerse ourselves into through our, through our tours, like the one in Egypt. And um, often you'll find that you're traveling with like-minded women on our trips and women often leave our trips with uh, lifelong friends and sometimes continue to do trips together with the same groups year after year on a different uh, itineraries. So it's, it's wonderful to see those groups of women coming back over and over again. And we work really hard on our trips to curate amazing adventures. And I know that the version of the Egypt itinerary that I just did is a little bit different from what Franny did a couple of years ago. 
because we're always taking your feedback into consideration and making the trip better and better and better each time. So I have been on the best <laughs> version of the Egypt trip um, that just happened. And, um, and we always do really appreciate your feedback. So um, thank you for that. And uh, looking forward to sharing a bit more about Egypt with you and some of the temples and the other things that we saw along the way. This is a photo of one of our lovely guides in Egypt. Her name is Yasmin. And uh, each of our guides on our Egypt trip is an Egyptologist. So they've been to university to get a degree in Egyptology. And they're the most amazing storytellers I've ever had the privilege of being around. Um, the guide the guide will be like a mother goose and all of all of the wild women will be like little goslings and um the guide because egypt has such a vast and expansive history and such a vast um such a vast storytelling mecca with all of the gods and goddesses and pagan worship the guide does such a beautiful job of layering different stories different pieces of history and different stories to really layer and add depth to your experience and to slowly integrate these these pieces of information that um, are there in the tombs and the temples and they slowly become part of your consciousness I felt at the end of this trip that I had been to Egypt Egyptian University um so yeah, they just really do a beautiful job of bestowing their their uh, wisdom in a very beautiful storytelling manner. Um, and the trip starts in Cairo. Um, here you can see this beautiful woman in front of the one of the pyramids of Giza. And what I love about arriving here to this destination is that the pyramids are sort of this mystical mystical idea that we have in our head, at least I have since I was a kid, and landing there and seeing them in reality, in person, was my wildest dream being manifested in my reality, which was an amazing feeling. Um, and they're part of old Egypt, so these these temples are go back to minus 2000, 2,500 BC, um, so which is like 4,500 years ago, this was built. Um, and the kings or the pharaohs in this time, their life was spent preparing for their death to immortalize them in their death. And these temples were built above ground and in the center, the, uh, the pharaoh would be immortalized in the middle of the temple or tomb. And so you have a really beautiful experience at the temples and you even get the opportunity to go inside should you wish and explore. You also get the opportunity to climb onto a camel's back should you choose and have a little camel ride. Um, so I, I love this photo because I feel like it represents such joy. And I, I feel like all these all these women had their, their wildest dreams come true in this photo. So I, I love it so much. Um, after the Pyramids of Giza, then we make our way um, south to a place called Luxor. So you might've heard of it. It's the place where the Valley of the Kings and Queens are. And it's the place where the temples of Karnak and Luxor are. So this photo here is a temple, either, either of uh, Karnak or Luxor. And the temples are a place of worship. So um, the ancient priests and priestesses would have been the occupants and it would have they would have created a, a place of worship and a place for people to return to to celebrate or have um, their, their pagan rituals where they worship the gods and goddesses of the time. Uh, and each each temple would um would have been dedicated to a specific god. Um, 
Yeah. So the, and then you can start to imagine, you can see how on these, on these pillars here, there's carvings on the wall and these temples are so old that they actually used to be painted, but the paint has worn off and we'll see some of the, the paint that is still, um, still exists on some of the tombs that are below ground, but these ones that are above ground have lost the painting. You can see here, um, just behind this hat, if you go up, you can see that there's a little bit, the bird is kind of colored a little bit of a blue color. So you can see sort of how there's a little bit of color, but uh, we put this photo in just to illustrate how, how important that guide is. She's really guiding you along in these temples and tours and taking you on this magical journey, bringing the gods and goddesses to life, bringing the history of Egypt to life. Um, yeah. After the, after the temple of temples of Luxor and Karnak will cross to the West bank of the Nile and you'll start to explore the Valley of the Kings and Queens. And I put this picture in because I love how it, it kind of describes it kind of, you have this, the feeling of going below ground and that's what the, the Valley of the Kings and Queens is. It's, um, after um, the period of the pyramids, then between between 1000 and 1500 BC, the pharaohs started to want a different kind of tomb. And so they started going underneath the ground and creating their mortuary tombs, tombs beneath the ground. They wanted to be buried underneath the ground. Um, and their life was still, their life was still preparing this underground tomb comp because a, a very big complex um a lot of them were like mazes of sorts and all of the walls and ceilings were engraved this one you can't see the engravings on them but um a lot of them had the engravings you can see some of the engravings here so whoever is buried in the tomb they would have had this their story depicted in the, in the hieroglyphs along the um, the temple walls or the tomb walls, excuse me. And here, what I love about this photo is you can start to see the colors that would have been on each, on each of the hieroglyphs in the temples or the tombs uh, and how the story and how the story comes together. There on the left, you can see that that is likely uh, a story of a God, like the God Horus, because you can see that bird head on top of his body. Um, and then perhaps as you move right, you can see that perhaps that's the Pharaoh second from the left. I mean, I'm not an Egyptologist, so I can't exactly explain this whole story to you, but you start to piece together things beyond your wildest imagination and you move through these engravings, these hieroglyphs and they take your breath away. You get to the end of the, the tomb complex and there is ultimately a sarcophagus waiting for you. Um, this sarcophagus here is a replica because m almost all of the sarcophaguses were looted in, um, were looted were, were looted because when you were a pharaoh or whoever you were buried in a tomb, you would have been mummified and your remains would be wrapped in gauze and then layered with lots of gold and precious stones and precious metals. And so lots of the grave robbers would have gone in and just looted all of these uh, tomb complexes. Uh, so a lot of the artifacts are missing and that's what why it was so special about King Tut's um, tomb being discovered in the 20s. It was the first tomb that was found intact. So we really learned a lot about how the mummies were preserved and what was kept in the tomb and um, they were able to save those items and um, preserve them and you can see them in in the museum in uh, Cairo. And 
here's the tomb of Nefertari. I'm going to hand it over to Klein here and she's going to speak to this story. Yeah, so the tomb of Nefertari is interesting because the it's in the the Valley of the Queens and the Valley of the Queens and the Valley of the Kings are in slightly different areas. And when a king, as Franny said earlier, when a king um, was living his life, he was always preparing for the afterlife. And so they had the tomb from the time that he would have been born and they're gathering the um, precious metals and jewels to go in the tomb. Um, but usually for the queens, once they died, then they would prepare the tomb. So they were much less elaborate as a result. Um, but Queen Nefertari, she was the beloved wife of, of King Ramses II. And um, you can really see that she had a much more status in ancient Egypt than uh, many of the other queens. So her tomb is considered to be the most well-preserved tomb of all of them. And, and this is um, on the right side, just one of the, of the graphics from that tomb. And um, you can just see that the vibrancy of the color. And this is, I think, about 3,000 years old. So the tomb of Nefertari is actually um, in the Valley of the Kings and Queens. You, you get a ticket and you can choose to go into three different tombs. Um, but for the tomb of Nefertari, you actually have to pay extra to go into this tomb. And you can choose to do this um, if you like. There's time for that. Um, but the reason is because it's so well preserved and they want to keep it that way. So they really want to limit the number of people um, that go in there and they've got it all climate controlled. And um, you can just see how incredibly vibrant it is. And that's because of the limits um, of the number of people. And there's a limit of how much time you can spend in there as well. I think it's 10 minutes or something like that. Um, but we were just treated with an absolute eye full of these sorts of images. So I believe this is the um, goddess. I believe it's Isis on the right, giving the um, symbol of life to Nefertari to sort of welcome her into the afterlife. That's how I interpret the story. And again, I'm also not an Egyptologist and um, Yasmin, who was our guide, shared so much information with us. And like I said, I just got home. So I'm, I'm literally still absorbing and, um, and processing the whole experience. Um, but, but this tomb, just like the others, you go down, um, deep down into the mountain and um, you, you just find these incredible drawings. Um, and paintings in there so that's that's Nefertari's tomb I love that I love that you're still processing it as well it took me a really long time to process my experience as well and I can remember calling my mom when I was on my trip and saying mom I can feel my consciousness expanding it was it was such a it was such a a trip of immense growth it was amazing Mm, mm, it is amazing and and just it's so humbling to be in the presence of this the work that we've heard about all our lives as you said um since we were children and the hieroglyphics and the importance of of that of the writing and the rosetta stone where it was all laid out and and to see these things is is really it's almost i would say overwhelming and it takes some time to process yeah I agree. It feels like you're not in reality when you're there. You're in a dreamland. It's true. <laughs> so special. Mm -hmm. um, here's another really special tomb in the valley of the, well, it's technically, it's a little bit unique because it's the mortuary tomb of um, Hatshepsut who was the first woman pharaoh of her of the egyptian reign um she was only one she was one of only three women to ever be pharaoh in the history of egyptian pharaohs and um she was a very powerful woman she ruled and created a lot of um progress and change and uh, industry for uh, her people and this was this as we said this was her mortuary tomb and um, it's quite amazing to be there and to see 
the infrastructure that she had created the vision for her mortuary tomb. And as you explore it as well, there's different and very beautiful stories being depicted uh, that, that your guide will share with you as well. You know, something I found really fascinating about this, um, this particular temple and many of the other temples is that, that for many years, no one really cared about the temples. And so because it's a desert landscape, the, the sand had come in and three quarters covered uh, most of the temples that we see on our tour. They were just, the tops of them were sticking out and uh, great crews of people were, were brought in to clear the, um, the sand away. So at one point, this temple was almost entirely under the sand and it was um, cleared away and um, a as many of the temples that we see are. And, and it's just amazing to think of how no one really cared for a long time. And then they, they kind of came back into, into interest and became uh, cleared away and, and sought after once again. I love that. And it's interesting to think how, if, if that, if this temple was buried under sand, it's interesting to think about the other stuff that, was completely covered that we're, we're still missing. Um, I think that our guide said that the temp, the temples were recovered and the tombs, a lot of the tombs were recovered, but they, they haven't found evidence of, of palaces. So where the Pharaohs would have lived, there's just no evidence of those complexes. And so those complexes are just buried under the sand somewhere for us to dream about <laughs> I love that uh, this is a this is a photo of the pal uh, the temple of Horus the temple of uh, Edfu or Horus um, and as we were speaking about the temples are the places of worship so um, the priest and priestesses would have been the keepers of of the temple and each temple would have been kind of dedicated to a specific God. And the God of this temple is Horus. You can kind of, you can see there's a bird statue just behind the two women in the middle there. And that would have been the stat Horus's statue. And you can see um, the carving second, if you go, if, if you move your eyes to the doorway and you scan two statues over or two carvings over that, you can see is Horace's head on that man's body. And then they're wearing the, the Egyptian king's crown. And I just love this photo because all these women are pretending to walk like Egyptians. <laughs> and uh, here's Abu symbol. So this was my favorite a temple that we explored. I loved how we woke up very early in the morning. Actually, we experienced it the night before in a light show, which I think you did too, Klein. Yeah. And uh, then we went to sleep and we woke up very early and arrived just as the sun was rising. Um, and as you walk towards this temple complex, you're you're arriving from the left and you can't see the front of it. You just see this mountain face. And as you're walking along the path, you the angle starts to change and you start to see um, Ramses, one profile of Ramses. So this is King Ramses um, temple here. You see one profile of Ramses and then you come across, I guess the second profile is is broken, but then you get the, th the third and the fourth. And it's just, it's such an epic view to experience and access very early in the morning. Um, we were there and there were not really any other people there at that time, which was really special as well. And um, we, um, well, right beside it as well, as Klein was mentioning, the wife of King Ramses is Nefertari. And so right beside Ramses' temple there, you see Nefertari's temple. Um, and so this is just a depiction of the power of King Ramses or um, the Pharaoh. If, if his wife 
was able to, if he was able to secure his wife and his wife got a temple of this size and this ornate, with this ornate, these ornate qualities, that was a representation of both of their power um, and presence. As well as the location of the the location of the temple here is just on the Nubian border. So if you can imagine you were um, an invader on the Nile and you were coming into Egyptian territory, and this is the site that you see on the side of the Nile, um, you might think twice about returning from where you have come <laughs> because of the example of such power here. Um, Klein, it's it's hard to get a sense of the scale here, but if you I know look it into is. The scale, you see the doorway, um, and that doorway. I would say a person would take up maybe one third of that doorway. I would um, say even less. I think even less. Even less. Yeah, maybe yeah. a quarter of that doorway. So, so it's really massive and impressive, and you just cannot capture that in a picture at all. And for me, one of the most amazing things about the, these two temples is they're built into the sides of mountains. But these mountains were actually in a slightly different location originally, and they were moved piece by piece, carefully cut apart and moved when they put in a dam that flooded the Nile. And these were in danger of being lost forever under the water. So um, there was it, it took years, literally, and um, a lot of engineers and a lot of thought into um, what are we going to do? Are we going to build a dome over these and and have them visible under the water? And and they decided in the end to move them. And when you're there and you just feel the magnitude and the the just the the size of these mountains, um, to think that they moved them like that's how dedicated they are to these to these ancient structures that um, that they would move and cut apart piece by piece an actual almost really two mountains because this is a separate big chunk from the one that um, is Ramsey's temple. So just incredible. Yeah, that one. And this is also, also the, the view behind me is the same same temple, but it's it's absolutely massive. Um, and again, you can't get a, really the scale of this with the person in front, especially because she's quite a ways in front of it. And it almost looks like she's the same size as Ramsey's. But again, she would just take up a small portion of that middle doorway to go through. So just to get an idea of the magnitude and it's, it's quite something. So true. And I heard that there was a, where the, where the temples were originally placed, it was a geologic, it's like a geologic hotspot in terms of energetic and energetic um, frequencies. Like it's one of the, zones in the world that has a, a an energetic pull um and i think even though it's moved i still think probably some of that energetic capacity would be in the area i had such a wild experience going into this this temple i um i have a picture here so this is inside king ramsey's temple here you can start to sort of see the scale of it a little bit more here because my body is there in that picture. Um, and you can look up on the ceiling and you can see how really every area of exposed rock is carved and painted. Um, but walking into this, into this temple, I had an energetic experience that it, just, it was like I was karate chopped in the head with a with an energetic wave that opened up all of my chakras. And um, I just walked around this temple basically bawling like a little baby because I was it was just such a special feeling. Um, and yeah, it was it was a really, really nice moment. Another one of my another woman who I connected with on this trip had a similar experience and, and um, we got to debrief a little bit about it after, but how, just how powerful that moment was and how unexpected it was as well. It was really special. 
I think there's just, there's so much energy in Egypt and in the temples and in the places that we visit that at some point, I think everyone has that feeling of sort of being taken over to some extent. Um, it sounds like what you're describing, Franny, was really quite special and um, transformative. Yeah, it was really amazing. And then we go on the Nile, which it, you know, after all of this, the, the first part of the trip is really loaded with these incredible, um, you know, the places and artifacts that we've um, heard about for all of our lives. And then after all of that, taking all of that in, we we get on this this boat um, and it's it's absolutely just the most relaxing thing um, to get on the boat on the Nile. And we, we actually cruise upstream, which is south um, on the river. And we have a sail on the boat, which we sometimes use if the weather allows, but we also have a tugboat that pulls us along. So the boat itself has no um, independent source of locomotion, it, just the sails, which is really cool. Um, so it's very quiet because when the tugboat is pulling the boat, they're way off ahead of us. We don't hear them at all. Um, so we're just, it's like, we're just, just really floating through the water. Um, and we'll obviously see other boats go by. Like you can see one small boat here and some of the big cruise type boats as well. Um, but it really is a very peaceful experience being on the boat. We eat our meals here. Um, there's these little loungy areas up on the deck that we can hang out. Um, and we do lots of stops along the way as well. So there are some quarries along the way where some of the rocks would have been taken. Uh, there's another beautiful sitting area um, on the boat. And there's always hot water for tea and coffee there as well. And we eat our meals up, up on deck as well. Um, and so as I was saying, we, we make stops along the way and um, quarries where some of the rocks would have been taken to build some of the temples that we'd seen. Um, so we get to kind of see all of how all the pieces fit together as we go. Um, I love so to, I love to on the, on the Dahabaya, on the boat here, how when you look over the edge and you look at the skyline, it's such an iconic skyline and you feel like you're out of time again, because you could be in the present moment, but you could also be with Agatha Christie on, on a, her in her book and you you could also be 1000 bc you could be with queen cleopatra there's just it just so it feels so timeless which is amazing and and adds again to that kind of dreamlike experience i think and in this part of egypt there's not a lot built up along the banks of the nile so you really are going through this kind of pastoral um landscape and, and atmosphere as you go along the Nile so it's not it's not like it's city after city after city um, as we're going which is also a really nice change after all of the the temples and the tombs this is what one of the rooms um, would look like on the Dahabia so it's um single beds uh two to a room and it's quite comfortable there's electricity and um, plugs and all of that. The uh, the generator does go off at night, so you don't want to leave your phone charging all night long because nothing will happen after about 10 p.m. But um, through most of the time that we would ever want electricity, it's available to us and hot showers and the whole bit. It's it's really quite deluxe. Um, and these cabins are down underneath the deck that uh, that we were looking at earlier. And so one of the stops that we make along the Nile, and this is me with the, the morning sun in my eyes, and Asma, who we visited. And um, and so Asma came onto our boat uh, pretty much with first sunrise. She's a busy woman. And um, she led us along the bank of the Nile to her little village. And we got to spend some time with her. And a friend of hers did some henna on our hands, um, which was lovely. And she she showed us around her family home and, and really talked to us about what life is like. So this is in the courtyard of the family home. And um, it's her mom sitting down as she would be the third from the left. Um, and then Asma is second from the, the right. And uh, some of the other ladies. And it looks like Zainab uh, maybe on the left there. Um, so we... we just really have time to hang out with these ladies and 
get a sense of what life is like for them and um, what it's like to live in a small village that's fairly cut off. And Asma has been um, welcoming tourists to her home now for a couple of years. And, and for her, it's really changed her life because it's it's given her a lot more confidence. She's learned to speak English. She's creating income for her family, um, as well as for some of the other local women who came in, like the woman who came and uh, did our henna. So so it's really kind of stoking up the local economy. And at the same time, we get a, a little window into a glimpse of what everyday life is like for for women um, in in Egypt today, in outside of the city, right? So in rural areas where things are tend to be a little more conservative. So you'll see most of the women will have their heads covered um, when we're outside of the big cities, whereas in the big cities, it's um, a little more some of each. And, um, you know, women have that choice. It's, um, it's up to them. But in the bigger cities, you'll see more variation and more variety, whereas in the um, smaller villages, you're going to see a little more conservative. And so it was really interesting just to get to know these women and to to see what life was like for them um, on the everyday. So this is Asma showing us uh, about how to make sun bread, which is the kind of bread that they make and leave to rise in the sun. So this is just actually a, a board that it's created on. This is not the bread itself, um, but you'd set the bread on this board and then it would go into the oven, which is on the right side of her. And every house would have this kind of a clay oven where they would bake their bread and um, and make they they roll out pastry and very finely and stuff it with all kinds of deliciousness <laughs> and um, meats and cheese and and um, and other goodies. And, and that goes in that clay oven as well. So so every house would have one out the back and um, she's she's just showing us how it all works here. So one of the other stops we made along the Nile is to this man, Mohammed. And um, what I learned after the fact, I didn't know this when we went to visit Mohammed, but uh, he's not a young man, as you can see. Um, but because of tourism, because of, of groups coming to visit and to learn about these crates that he makes, um, he's now able to afford his own home for the first time in his life. Um, so what we did with him is we went and we um, helped him build. We each helped build one of these crates. And these crates would be used to ship things around like, you know, a crate of mangoes or um, or whatever needs to be moved from point A to point B. So these crates would be used. Um, so and he works at lightning speed. It's amazing. And um, if you look into the back there, you can see this whole pile of crates. But what you can't see is on the other side of of him on the right side behind his back, there's another massive pile of crates and all the chairs on the um, edges there that you can see are also made um, from this same technique. And he just puts the holes in, um, it's palm, uh, palm wood, puts holes and then drives the other pieces through um, the hole. So there's no screws or nails or anything like that. No, no um, string holding it together. It's just all, into these intricate little um, holes that he creates using um, it's kind of like he, he uses a, a measuring stick and, and and so they're all exactly the same so they can stack up so so we visited him and um, this is uh, one of the women from my group and they had just just high-fiving each other with uh, having just finished made this box amazing another another thing that I remember from this experience is that his he's transformed his feet to be like hands yeah. so he can he has basically four hands and he can hold things with his feet and so he has um freedom with his more freedom with his hands which was quite amazing i thought yeah it was amazing so he's, he's measuring and moving the stick with his feet and punching the holes with his hands and, and just wild uh, yeah how he how he does these so quickly Well, this was another really lovely experience, and our group was the first to to take part in this uh, um, this particular experience, which was a cooking class. So um, the two women on the right hand side of this picture are mother and daughter, um, and they welcomed us into their house and 
The mother is a culinary teacher. She's retired now. Um, but she had a whole lot of different food that was there for us and taught us how to prepare it into things like baba ganoush. And we made something with that puff pastry that uh, with a phyllo pastry full of um, ground beef. We made chicken. Um, we made uh, vegetables, a roasted vegetable dish, and we made a fruit salad for dessert. So we spent a couple of hours sitting around the table on their terrace with all the ingredients and just learning how to put them all together. And then while everything cooked, um, we relaxed for a little while and then we all came inside and we all sat around the table and, uh, and enjoyed a meal together. And it was just delightful getting to know these two women. And um, I took notes and I, I have made some of the recipes since I got home. If you followed the Facebook page, you'll, you'll see some of uh, the pictures there from those recipes, but uh, just heartwarming to spend time with these women in their house and um, and get to know them a little bit more. And Fatima on the far right with the uh, with the hoodie on, um, when when she wasn't having her picture taken, she would bring her hoodie down and and let us see her hair, which is kind of a rare treat. And women only in the presence of other women, if they um, tend to cover their hair in public, then they would only uncover it when there are no men around. So. Um, so it really felt like this intimate experience where we got to to sit with this woman who, if we saw her anywhere else, um, she would have her hair hair covered. Um, but for us, she was just one of the girls with her with her hoodie down and uh, just kind of relating to us um, just as 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 we were. And it, it just felt really lovely to to spend time with them. Thank you both for walking us through the ultimate Egypt. It's um, I loved all your storytelling. Um, as we wait for questions to come in, because I don't see any right now, one question I did have um was if you could let us know what the average temperature would be and what we can expect um on this um tr this trip. Yeah, I can I can speak to what it was like when I was there and um. For wild women, we tend to choose the times of the year where the weather is best for our trips, no matter where they are in the world. Um, so avoiding those times when it's really, really hot there. And I can imagine uh, having been there when it wasn't so hot that it, because there's not a lot of shelter, right? Uh, around some of these places that the sun could be quite intense. Um, so I would say now I'm not so good with Fahrenheit, but in Celsius, it was sort of low to mid 20s, which I think is around 75, 80. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, either of you in, in Fahrenheit. And those were daytime temperatures. And then at night, it would cool down. So it might get down to, um, say, 15, 15 degrees in that range for the evenings, and um, which would be about, I think, around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So in that uh, 60 to 80 degree range for um, the time I was there. And um, and I think that tends to be around where we sit on our trips, but maybe Franny, you have a little bit more info about that. Yeah, that's what I found too. I was there um, sort of at the beginning of December and I uh, actually stayed, I stayed longer because I, I had, um, I, I celebrated Christmas there with a friend from university. And I found the same thing like during the day it was, it was warm, but not too hot because you're walking around and you're active, you do get a little bit warmer, but it's not overwhelmingly warm. And, um, and then at night I found it quite cool. So I, I brought a pair of wool tights and I would often layer them underneath my like linen pants or under a, under a dress or something like that. And I had a sweater. Yeah. Yeah, I had a sweater. And then some mornings I would wear a, a down vest over a shirt. Oh, that's so a good was, idea. Yeah. yeah, it could be a bit, bit cool in the mornings and evenings, but very pleasant. Not too, too overwhelmingly hot during the days. Great. Um, We had a question about whether or not it's possible to play pay a single supplement for a single room on the board, the boat. Can we clarify, do you mean, do you mean only buy a single room on the boat and not in hotels? 
Um, let's answer both. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, Julia? Please. What for both? Is it possible to pay a single supplement um for the whole trip and or just the boat? Okay. Okay. It is possible to pay for a single supplement for the whole trip. Uh, we have a we do have a maximum number of single supplements we can get. <clears throat> and um the reason we have those is actually because of the boat. So so depending on how many women are signed up for your trip, um, you may or may not be able to get a single supplement for just the Dahabaya portion of the trip. But we're always happy to work with you and figure out what is possible. Great. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, another question for, was, would we receive a suggested list of clothing? Oh, yes. <laughs> on every, on every, um, expedition we, we run, we we'll, we always have a packing list with, um, recommended items and then not mandatory items, but suggested items and recommended items. Right. Yeah. Yeah. On every single trip page on our website, if you go to the trip details tab on each of the trips, you can see we've already linked a PDF of the packing list that you can um, download and print out for yourself. Um, someone would like to know if we are planning any other itineraries or sites for someone returning a second time. Okay. I dream about going. I, so it, this, this trip was probably the, one of the best experiences I've ever had in my whole life. And I keep thinking that I want to go back and, and I think you could go back. And to be honest with you, I think you could do the exact same itinerary, which it wouldn't be the exact same because as Klein mentioned, we've just, we've just changed the, itin we've upgraded the itinerary from what it was last year to how it is this year. So we added the cooking class that Klein is talking about and, and we added an extra day or two to kind of create a little bit more spaciousness in the itinerary. Um, and we, we really played, we really enhanced and made it the best trip possible. But even if you were to do the same trip in Egypt twice, you, you would go into a temple and you would hear different stories and you would, you would like, depending on the guide who is, showing you around, you would see a different side of the temple or you would hear a different story. And so you would just, you would just learn more and more of those layers of the storytelling would, would, um, would be, would become apparent. And the other thing I think too, is that, um, it's, it's just, um, as Klein was talking about some of the things I had forgot, I had not forgotten, but you kind of, you don't remember every single detail so well. You just, you just, what I really remember about the trip is how I felt there, which was just amazing and like living in a dream space. So I think to have that feeling again would be so special. It's so true, actually. I, I've had I've been on trips with women who have come for the second time, um, not to Egypt, but on other trips. And we we are different when we experience the trip again. And so we experience it differently. And I had one woman on a horse trip over and over saying, well, we didn't stay here before. We didn't see this before. And I was like, yes, we did. Um, and, and it's just that our memories play tricks on us. And um and we we really do come at it with a, with a very different lens when we do something for the second time, and and sometimes also I mean you may not have that same feeling again, Franny, if you were to go again, but you would experience it in a, in a very different way, perhaps, and right. have that away from it as well. So. That's a good point. And we're also constantly updating our itineraries as well, which leads to my next question: is about the overnight train. So can we talk about that quickly? Yes. So I had the luck, pleasure, and privilege of experiencing the overnight train. And let me tell you, 
it is type two fun. So I don't know if you guys know about the difference between type one and type two fun, but type one fun is fun that you're experiencing in the moment, like a party or um, this webinar. We're having such a great time sharing stories and laughing. Um, and type two fun is an experience that is not really that enjoyable when you're experiencing it. But after the fact, you realize that, that, oh, heck, that was such a, such a great experience because I'll never forget it. And that is what the overnight train is. Um, from Cairo to Luxor. Saying that, we did take it out of the itinerary because we felt that it was just a little bit, it was a little bit too much. So after all, after traveling to all the way to Egypt, you're a little bit jet lagged and um, women were arriving in Luxor a little bit tired. So we, we've removed, we've removed the tr overnight train and instead we put in a short uh, domestic flight from Cairo to Luxor uh, so that you can arrive in Luxor re relatively rested and uh, take in those, those temples um, fairly fresh, but, um, let me tell you, it was an experience my, and they served breakfast on the train and it was, it was, um, on a tray. It was a bag of potato chips, a croissant, a little muffin and some other, some other kind of bread type product. It was the funniest thing. I love, love, love that type two fun um, analogy, Franny. I've not heard that before. And I can think of so many times where I would describe what I experienced as type two fun. It sure wasn't that fun at the time, but boy, did I get more character from having gone through it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Love character building and fun. We did get a box <laughs> breakfast as well um, when we took the, the early morning flight to Luxor and um, it wasn't necessarily that much fewer carbs, we'll say. Okay. <laughs> lots of bread, lots of bread. <clears throat> Might be wise to pack a few emergency um, protein bars. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Mm -hmm. Although the food in general, I know this isn't a question that has come up at all, but the food in general has been... Um, was great on the trip. There was a lot of variety and um, a lot of the hotels we stayed in had a great big breakfast buffet that you could have pretty much anything your heart desired. Um, lots of uh, chicken, fish and um, beef for a lot of the meals. I know they can accommodate vegetarians as well, although we didn't have any um, vegetarians on our trip. So um, but I, I thought the food was was really quite good in Egypt. Um, in general, just that, that box breakfast was not my favorite. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I loved the food so much. Yeah. Amazing. Um, another question was, uh, what is the max number of women on the Egypt trips? And I just looked that up quickly. So you guys don't have to look it up. The maximum is 14. Um, but would either of you like to talk about what the average number is? Sure. I mean, I don't know what the average number is off the top of my head, but I would say it's a little bit lower than that. Yeah. For example, when I was there, well, when I was there, I was, I was there right at the end of 2021. So it was, it was still not that many people were traveling at that time. So it was, it was me and three other women. So we, we had a da, uh, the boat to ourselves, basically. It was, it was amazing. But, and I would say that m the majority of the trips have more than that, probably around eight people. My trip was the same, uh, myself and three others. And so it is, there's a lot of space on the boat um, when you have a group that small. But again, that wouldn't be typical. Um, it it was just a just the situation as it is right now that we ended up with that number. So which segues into the next question. Um, are there any safety concerns? I honestly noticed nothing untoward when I was there. I felt very safe the whole time. You're picked up before you even pass passport control when you get there in the airport. So you literally, you walk out of the gate, you, you know, you follow the crowd through. And then I came through a door 
um, out into the into the world. <laughs> and there was our, our tour manager with a sign that said Wild Women Expeditions on it right in the front of the line. So um, from there, I was I was whisked out through passport control um, right out to the parking lot and um, and into the into the van. So it was just such a smooth and easy, easy entry to Egypt same when we left same thing um and in between we're always um there's always someone with us there's always we're in vehicles we're going in and out of vehicles and there's just never a moment where I felt like there was anything um anything unsafe at all and I, one of the nice things right now is there aren't as many tourists in the Middle East because of what's going on so we actually do get to enjoy those smaller groups a little bit more. Um, and Egypt is considered a safe place. There aren't travel advisories to Egypt right now. So um, if you're thinking about going now is actually one of the best times to go. Um, yeah, after COVID was a good time as well for that same reason, but uh, now is, is, is another great time to go. Great. Uh, we have one more question that I can see right now. Oh, a couple more, but <laughs> let's ask this one first. Um, for guests, um, do they offer gratuities to the women's uh, who are offering their homes that we visit? Um, and I think I can mention quickly on our website per um, each trip page under the trip details, we do talk about tipping. Um, and for this particular trip, we do give guidelines for tipping for um, per, per traveler per day for um, the staff on the Dahayaba um, and then for our wild woman expedition guide. But can either of you talk to whether or not anyone um, tipped any of the uh, local community members that we visited? Um, I, go ahead, Franny. On my trip, the guide took care of all of the extra tipping. So we only had to tip the our main guide our driver and our um actually we didn't even have to tip our driver but we could if we wanted to because they were with us for a large chunk of the time and um the 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 folks on the dahabia yeah that was that was the same for us as well right um how do you ensure that participants can handle the activities which might be strenuous? Yeah, so my uh, strong recommendation is to is to have a little bit of uh, general fitness going on this trip, but it's not a super strenuous trip, but you will be on your feet quite a lot walking through some of the temples and the ground is uneven. Um, so you want to be aware of that for sure. Um, and then absolutely plan to arrive at least a day early. It, it's even though we've created a bit more space in the itinerary, it's still a lot. And you want to be well rested when you arrive. So if you can arrive and get a good night's sleep and, you know, get up the next day and feel refreshed um, to start the tour, that would be my my really strong recommendation for this trip. And then you you can land running and you'll have the energy to, to see and do the things that are on the itinerary um, as opposed to screeching in at the last minute and, and really having all that jet lag to, to deal with. Um, and yeah, so being comfortable on your feet, um, I would say getting out walking in the, in the months before you plan your trip would be really uh, a very good idea. It's not strenuous in that we're climbing mountains or or doing anything like that but like I said you are on your feet quite a lot and the ground is quite uneven so even you know bringing a collapsible pole if that's something you feel would be helpful for you in those situations that would work as well great well we're just about at the end of our time so um, if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A box and we will make sure to respond to you um, via email or give you a call um, shortly, whether it is tomorrow or sometime this week, we will get um, answers for you. Um, and while anyone else enters uh, their questions in the Q&A box, I just wanted to give Franny and Klein an opportunity to give us any last thoughts. 
Um, any last thoughts? I'm not sure, but I just, I mean, I know I've said it already, but I just, this trip really, I think came at a time in my life where its impact was especially vast and it really shaped and changed me. And I learned so much about myself and the world because of it. Past, present, and future it was really, really amazing. And um, I loved sharing it with the women on my trip and our very special, special guide. It was just, it was, it was out of time and space, this trip for me. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, like I said, I'm still digesting from my trip, just having come back a few weeks ago. Um, but it's, it's big. Like, I mean, like these columns on the picture in front of us, you, you, it, it there's just, it's just so massive and so, um, so much to this trip. Um, you could really be uh, processing it for a long, long time, all of the things that you see, that you experience. And I was also lucky to be with a phenomenal group of women and a wonderful guide. And um, I feel like we'll we'll stay in touch. And um, yeah, my heart is full. My heart is full from the trip. And there's just so much. It's just a, it's a, a fullness on every level, heart, mind, soul. Amazing. And with that, just want to thank everyone who was able to join us uh, this afternoon and evening. Um, I hope everyone took a little bit away from uh, what Franny and Klein was able to share and that you've been inspired to go back or go to Egypt for the first time. Um, again, this recording will be sent out to everyone to rewatch at their leisure. Um, but thank you for your time and thank you and have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you for coming. Bye.